Okay, so once you're finished cleaning up your vector, no matter how you got it to where it is, because we've discussed three options, right? You can just do it directly in Illustrator with the blob brush, the pencil tool, the pen tool, like you did your logo. Whoops, moving things. Or you can digitally ink it in Photoshop. There we go. And then bring in that JPEG and then live trace it. Or you can digitally ink it in the real world digitally ink it, or sorry, scan it, and then bring in that scan, clean it up, and bring that in to Illustrator and live trace it. But no matter how it gets there, you have the ability to use the pencil tool, the pen tool, the blob brush to clean it up once it's there. So here's the difference between using the pencil tool to close gaps and using the blob brush. When I do the pencil tool to do it, you'll see that the paths uh, that's annoying, will overlap. So I use the pencil tool to close that gap, and you see how the paths overlap there. But if I use the blob brush to work over the top of it, it will merge them together. So now they don't overlap anymore. Does it matter if they overlap? Not really. It, this is just understanding what, what you're working with. It would matter if you put a stroke on it though. But I don't like to use strokes because they seem to mess everything up. All right, so once you're happy with it, and I need to be less perfectionist and move on, because you can keep messing with it endlessly. But this is going to get changed a lot as we color it, right? And you can also use the smooth tool to just kind of do averages really quick. And then if you need to just smooth everything, there are, there are ways to do that I can help you with. Like you can simplify the entire image. I actually kind of like these little blobs, these little variations. So you can also just kind of embrace what your natural inking is like, whether it's done digitally or by hand. And let it stand. That's always an option too. So there's no quote-unquote perfect line art. But there are different styles, right? So if you're going for a more animation look, you want thinner lines. If you're going for a more editorial look, you want thicker lines. And whatever you have, that's what we're going to color. Okay, so my line art looks pretty good. I want you to notice I have a lot of shapes that are completely contained, which means they are solidly outlined. And then I have some that are open. You see that opening right there? You see this opening here that I left intentionally between the helmet. And that, that comes to play whether the shapes are open or closed uh, when we color. But it's naive to think that all of your shapes are going to be nicely closed. So for instance, I might want to close this one. And I can do that with the overlap. And if I wanted them not to overlap, I could use the blob brush and just paint that in. And this will be the last, I promise. All right, adjustments I make. But that's why Illustrator sticks around. People like the control that that gives. Once it's done, remember that this has no white shapes in it. If you have white shapes in it, you can't do this. Drag it off of the artboard and have it be just line art. So you want to make sure it's just black line art. You can also make sure that it's 
all filled with the same color by selecting it all with the large selection tool and then clicking here and making sure that that black is all the way in the far left corner. That's called 100% black. Even there, it's actually not 100% black. You can see that's in CMYK, it's 75% cyan, 68% magenta, 67%. What you can do is actually set each of these to 100%. And that is what's true printing 100% black. And it might not look that different on the screen, but it will look different in terms of printing. All right. So file, we're now going to save it. I'm going to save it to my computer as an Illustrator file, and I'm going to change its name from test to my full assignment name, and this is my vector line art. So this is assignment five, spot illustration, vector, line art, two words, as an AI. I'm also, because I want you to get into this habit, especially because these computers might get replaced on us at any time, I'm going to save it as to the creative cloud. The same name. Oh, I should have put my name in there too. So much to do. Okay, now I'm going to save it as to my computer a different format so that it can be moved into Photoshop. And that format is going to be EPS, just like we did for our logo. I'll throw my name in there. So I'm saving these onto my computer into my folder. So this is my first EPS file for this. You can check the EPS by opening it in, in preview. You can zoom in, you'll see it's perfectly scalable. It will be perfectly clean. There are no pixels anymore. Even though it might look very similar to the digital inking that you did. But now it's a vector, which is a beautiful thing. So I'm going to mark that as purple. Why not? Now I can close Illustrator. Close it all the way. But how do I put my vector line art here into Canvas? It won't take an EPS. You can't put vector files online. So I have to do what I did for my logo. I have to open up Photoshop. I'm going to go ahead and quit Illustrator because I don't need it. Quit Preview. Don't need that anymore. Quit this because I'm not using that. Right? And I'm going to say File New in Photoshop. Because if you try to open your EPS in Photoshop, it will force you to rasterize it. So this is what you don't want to do. I can't right-click this and open it with Photoshop without it giving me this, saying, how many pixels do you want it to be? What mode do you want it to be? It's interesting to know what its default is, right? So its default is basically the default of the size I brought into Photoshop. But its mode is CMYK, because that's the default mode outside of Illustrator which is different than Photoshop's default mode, which is RGB. And we'll learn a little bit more about that as we talk more about the nuance of digital coloring. So instead of doing that, that rasterizes it. That's shitty. That's terrible. Excuse my language. Don't do it because we've spent all that time making it a vector. So instead, we go to Photoshop. We say File, New, and we create a canvas size. And I'm going to use 8 by 10 by 350. And if your spot illustration is wider than it is tall, do 10 by 8 by 350. Then I'm going to drag and drop that EPS onto my new Photoshop canvas. And by doing that, it keeps it as a smart object. You can test if it's a smart object by trying to erase it, and it won't let you. It says, we can't erase this. It's a smart object. Do you want to rasterize it first? Do you say cancel? No, I don't want to rasterize it. I want to keep that. In fact, I am so adamant about keeping this as clean line art that I'm going to lock it immediately. And then I'm going to say file save as. And I'm going to put in a new name. So FA22 Carl Assignment 5 uh, Color spot illustration 
with vector line art. This is an overkill explanation, but that's what we're doing. We're going to color it in Photoshop, but keep the vector line art as a smart object on top of everything. This is called digital coloring. Just to make sure, I'm going to save it to my computer with the same name as a PSD, my working format. I'm going to mark that as green. So I'm saving it to the cloud, I'm saving it to my disk, and I have a thumb drive, I can save it to that after, right? So, all in my assignment 5 folder. Now, how do we go about setting this up for coloring? So before I get into it, that's all saved, that's good. Let's go back to the assignment. And you'll see that it gives some examples of different types of digital inking different techniques, and then it gives you this very handy digital coloring primer that I've prepared for you, which can also be downloaded in your link section. And it just walks you through the process of digital coloring just in one image. So the first is you sketch, then you do your vector line art, and then the, the first step is called flatting, F-L-A-T-T-I-N-G. -T -T flatting is usually done when, when it's done by people like us and not professional colorists, we usually use what's called a flat local color. Local color means the color the thing is no matter the lighting condition. So a lemon, for instance, local color of a lemon is yellow. If the local color isn't yellow, then it's not a lemon anymore. Might be a lime, might be an orange, right? So the local color is the color the thing is no matter what the lighting is. Once you've done flats, and all digital coloring starts with flats, whether it's local color or some random color, then you can do variations on the flats. And there are a few different options. One variation is called duotone, where you split the local color into a lighter version and a darker version, basically highlights and shadows of that local color. So if the local color is yellow, like a lemon, the highlight is going to be a little bit lighter than that yellow. Basically, you take that local color and you add white to it. And the shadow is going to be a little bit darker. You take that local color, you add black to it. If it's using those two colors, or those two, the, the same color, the same hue, but two different tints and tones, right? But it, it divides them with a crisp division at the edge. That's called hard edge duotone. Sometimes called crisp edge duotone. And in animation, sometimes called cell shading. You'll most commonly see this in animation. When you need coloring that looks very production level and can be matched panel to panel, like you do in frames of animation, hard edge duotone is a good way to go. It's a simple way of adding a little extra dimension to your color. If you're really on a budget, like Sunday comic strips, you know, in the 1980s, and you're running peanut strips on Sunday, you just fill those with flat color. You don't do any duotone at all. So Charlie Brown's shirt is always yellow doesn't matter if a, a locomotive is shining its bright beams on him or not. It's the same yellow. That's just flat color. Another type of duotone is to soften the transitions between those different tints and tones of the same hue, the same color. That's called soft edge duotone or duotone soft edge. Sometimes it's called gradient edge, but these are the terms we'll use, right? So these are the terms that will be on your exam. So soft edge duotone looks a lot more painterly and sculpted than hard edge, but it's the exact same principle. You take the local color and you do light and dark variations on it. You might just use softer edge brushes and might use different opacities. Duotone doesn't mean just two, two tones. It means light and dark. So here you see just two tones, but here you see a whole range between almost pure white and the darkest shadow of the core shadow, right? So what's the difference between soft edge duotone and what would usually be considered a special effect in coloring? And that's what's called full spectrum. Full spectrum is when you split from duotone and instead you add different colors into your coloring. So that lemon now has purple in its shadow because in color theory, purple is the complement of yellow. It's a good shadow tone. It also has some greens in the browns, you know, and it's using more color. 
The problem is when you use full spectrum with black line art, 